Welcome to Pathophysiology of Shock. We'll be discussing various aspects of shock caused not only by trauma, but by other mechanisms. So we better start out with a definition. So, shock is defined as A. Systolic blood pressure less than 90 in adults, or less than 70 plus 2 times the age in kids. B. Inadequate perfusion to supply oxygen and nutrients to tissues. C. Stunned reaction to your latest phone bill or D, inadequate delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. Hmm. These two sound somewhat the same, but they're not. And there is actually some discussion as to exactly what the de definition is going to be. This is a little subtle. It breaks down into two different kinds of shock. Is there a perfusion problem, where oxygen and nutrients are present, but blood can't get to the tissues? Or is it a non-perfusion problem, where blood can get to the tissues, but oxygen and or nutrients are not present? And of course, there's always the famous, or both could be happening at the same time. It's kind of like fishing. If there's no water, well, there's no fish. Or, if there are no fish, it doesn't matter how much water there is. Are there common characteristics to both of these kinds of shock? Well, yes, there are. Basically, end organ function is going to be changed. The one that is most likely to be changed is going to be the level of consciousness. The brain is exquisitely sensitive to problems with either oxygenation or nutrients and is also exquisitely sensitive to poor perfusion. Now, mind you, this may only present as an anxiety problem or severe agitation, but this is altered level of consciousness. But what about tachycardia? Well, usually, yes, but there are instances where shock may not be accompanied by tachycardia. Tachypnea is also usually classified as one of the signs of shock, but again, it's usually, not always. So let's real quickly look at non-perfusion shock. This can be broken down into two parts. Metabolic, where there is a lack of nutrients, and what would be the nutrient that would be most likely missing that would cause altered end organ function. Basically glucose, hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia could be considered a type of metabolic shock. Respiratory shock is the other one, where either there is either lack of oxygen or the ability to use the oxygen, or the, the patient is unable to remove CO2 from their bloodstream. So what might cause lack of oxygen or the ability to use it? Hypoxemia, absolute carbon monoxide poisoning, and cyanide are the three classic areas where there is either not enough oxygen in the blood or either the ability to transport or use it is compromised. And in terms of removing CO2, basically it is the inability to ventilate. It could be from hypoperfusion for other reasons also. When we talk about perfusion shock, we're going to be discussing four different classes of shock. These are hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive. In these cases, where there is lack of perfusion, the main problem that occurs at a cellular level is the fact that the cells become hypoxic. When the cells become hypoxic, what happens to the metabolism in the cells? It switches to anaerobic metabolism, and the byproduct of this will be lactic acid production. If the lactic acid is allowed to build up, the, lactic, the lactate level may be predictive of the mortality in this case. As the acidosis increases and as the lack of energy gets worse, there is damage to the mitochondria. And since the mitochondria are the source of the energy, this becomes an accelerating process. There is inadequate energy production already, and now it is getting worse. In addition, other organelles within the cells are damaged, specifically the lysosomes, which tend to break down intracellular material and the cell walls. When the cell walls are disrupted, the cellular ion shifts are disrupted, specifically the sodium-potassium pump and calcium shifts that normally occur for cells to function. When the sodium-potassium pump fails, sodium is allowed to leak into the cell. 
water follows the sodium, putting pressure inside the cell on the cell membrane, which has already been disrupted. This fluid shift, which may be either in or out, but is usually inward, will disrupt the cell wall and cause cell death. One of the types of perfusion shock does have a special case. This is sepsis. Sepsis is caused by a primary immune inflammatory cascade caused by a bac usually bacterial infection. In this case, cytotoxic mediators are released, and cytotoxic means they're going to kill the cells directly. So we cause direct cellular damage. This is the case where shock actually follows the damage, but then the shock actually increases the damage in and of itself. The fluid shifts that occur are twofold. First of all, the water may shift in between fluid spaces. This specifically occurs when there is lack of volume in one of the fluid spaces. As the water shifts, this can aggravate volume loss, specifically intravascularly. Vessel integrity may also be lost. This occurs primarily in septic and anaphylactic shock. It will occur in all forms of shock eventually. Because of this vessel integrity being lost, the vessels will leak fluids. This can aggravate or add to the total body hypovolemia or the intravascular hypovolemia. In addition, the protein that leaks out through these walls can coagulate in the interstitial and in the intravascular space. So how does the body respond to shock? Unfortunately, its major responses, should, which should help in the face of shock, may eventually cause more problems. The first thing that occurs is adrenal stimulation with the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. These cause vasoconstriction, if it is possible to do so. In some cases, it is not. And this would be primarily an alpha-1 response. In addition, because epinephrine and norepinephrine also have beta-1 properties, there is increase, or at least an attempt to increase, cardiac output from the beta-1 response. Vasoconstriction is also caused by other means, specifically renal hyperperfusion, either from lack of volume to the kidneys or from the vasoconstriction from the adrenal stimulation, will activate the renin-angiotensin system. Mm, you remember what that is? Okay, let's review it. Renin is released from the kidneys. It converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted in the lungs to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor in and of itself. In addition, it stimulates the release of aldosterone, which is not only a vasoconstrictor, but also retains sodium in the urine, therefore decreasing urinary output and retaining fluid. Another factor that occurs is ADH release from the pituitary. Although this isn't a primary vasoconstrictor at the doses released from the pituitary, what it does cause is restriction of sodium excretion in the kidneys, again retaining fluids. The vasoconstriction actually may decrease perfusion, aggravating the shock in local areas. In addition, the inflammatory response will be initiated. This cascade can in initiate problems that can extend to multiple organs and be very severe. Generally speaking, mild shock, although it initiates this cascade, does not cause severe problems, but any secondary shock after that will in cause a massive inflammatory cascade. There will be local vasoconstriction, and this may be spotty throughout the organs. There may be thrombosis within the vessels or within the organs themselves. These two combine lead to re regional malperfusion within the organs, and there is release of superoxide radicals, which directly damage cells and organs. And all of this combines to cause more cell damage. So this inflammatory cascade actually causes more damage than the initial shock itself. Okay, now that that's out of the way, 
I want you to take out your study guide, and if you have not already done so, I want you to look at the four tables on there. Three of them are specifically for the questions to follow. Fill these out as best you can. What is the pathophysiology of hypoperfusion for hypovolemic shock, obstructive shock, cardiogenic shock, and distributive shock? We're looking for the underlying problems that occur within the body that cause the shock. On the next one, look for what are the actual physical causes. I want at least three different causes for hypovolemic shock, obstructive shock, cardiogenic shock, and distributive shock. And the last one is what does each type of shock do to the hemodynamic factors, specifically the preload, the afterload, the stroke volume, and the cardiac output. I suggest you pause this video at this time and go ahead and fill those out before we proceed. Okay, let's start with hypovolemic shock. What is the pathophysiology behind hypovolemic shock? Basically, the volume within the blood vessels, the intravascular volume, decreases. As it decreases, it leaves a gap, causing a decrease in pressure within the blood vessels. The lack of pressure causes decreased flow. The response to this is constriction of the vessels. This is done in an effort to try to maintain the flow or the pressure. This vasoconstriction raises the diastolic pressure. Systolic pressure may or may not drop at this point. It depends on how rapidly the blood fluid is being lost. But it's the raise in the diastolic pressure that causes the classic finding in hypovolemic shock, which is a decrease in the pulse pressure. Now, how would you define the pulse pressure? OK, the pulse pressure is the systolic minus the diastolic pressure. So there is no specific number that is used, but generally speaking, if the systolic minus the diastolic pressure is less than 30, this would be abnormal. For instance, a patient who is bleeding, who has a blood pressure of 120 over 100, would actually be heading for profound shock. So if you see shock, plus a narrow pulse pressure, I would like you to think of hypovolemia as a possible cause, whether there is an obvious source or not. Speaking of source, what are the possible etiologies? Well, I hope you came up with multiple ones, but these are the ones that I came up with. Acute blood loss, trauma, obviously, GI bleeds, aneurysm ruptures, specifically abdominal aortic aneurysms and thoracic aneurysms, and pregnancy. Not just at birth, don't forget the ectopic pregnancy, which can cause profound bleeding. The other class of hypovolemic shock are straightforward fluid losses without blood loss. These can be from GI losses, such as vomiting and diarrhea, renal losses, such as in diabetics with an obligate urine fluid loss from the high glucose levels, from burns, who lose fluid not only from the edema that develops from the lack of vessel integrity, but also through the burned skin, which no longer has the impermeable epidermal layer. And other third space losses, such as loss into the peritoneum or into the pleural space. What do you do for it? Well, that's fairly straightforward. Fix it. Replace the volume with normal saline or Ringer's lactate. For trauma, there is no evidence at this point that supports colloids or hypertonic saline in trauma. Multiple studies have been done, but none of the evidence supports using either colloids or hypertonic saline at this point. How much? Well, that's always a good question. There is no really good consensus. However, I can tell you that the 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus that was extrapolated from children is much too much to give in most adults. There are exceptions to this rule. Generally speaking, depending on the age and underlying health of the patient, start with 250 to 500 milliliters, reassess your patient, and then go up from there, rather than it doing a predetermined bolus of somewhere between 2 and 3 liters.
This is especially important in the elderly, as too much volume given too suddenly will stay in the intravascular space and may overload the heart. A special case is Burns, where there is a specific formula, which is 4 milliliters per kilogram per percent burn. This is to be given over the first 24 hours, but half of it is to be given over the first 8 hours. So the simple calculation is to take 2 milliliters per kilogram per percent burn and run that volume of fluid over 8 hours. It may take 2 IVs to accomplish this. In trauma, there is some consensus regarding the amount of fluid to give. If you can stop the bleeding, and I mean permanently stop it, there's no risk of them re-bleeding, then you are allowed to get the pressure up within normal range. By the way, this does not count use of a tourniquet. If you go to a tourniquet to stop the bleeding, you may assume that when the tourniquet is removed, the blood pressure will drop again. That is something you want to avoid. If you can't stop the bleeding, or you can't be sure that the bleeding will not start again, only get the blood pressure up to 80 to 90 systolic. This only counts in trauma. This is done for two reasons. We don't want to disturb the clots. Clots can be disturbed in two ways. We can blow them off with, by increasing the intravascular pressure, or we can dilute the clotting factors with saline, which contains no clotting factors. The other major reason is that you may find that increasing the blood pressure to normal will trigger off an immune response that will kill your patient two days later. This is known as Multiple Organ Dysfunction Syndrome, or MODS. Remember I told you that shock of any kind triggers off an inflammatory response. If you get the patient out of shock, if you remove this inflammatory response, and the patient returns to a shock state, a secondary shock response will occur that is massive. This massive shock response basically causes an anaphylactic type of response throughout the body. And this secondary drop in blood pressure will trigger off all of the factors that we discussed under inflammatory response in shock. And two to three days later, your patient will die. We can virtually guarantee that in patients who have bleeding that has not been controlled, that there is going to be a secondary drop in blood pressure when they go to the operating room or in any effort during the effort to control the bleeding. So this is where the 80 to 90 systolic limit comes. One more special time, and this is hypovolemia and head trauma. Remember rule number one, closed head trauma does not cause hypotension. If your patient has closed head trauma and they are hypotensive, look for blood loss elsewhere. It is not because they have closed head trauma. Rule number two will supersede the permissive hypotension allowed by keeping the blood pressure between 80 and 90 systolic. And that is, in the case of closed head trauma, you must maintain a normal blood pressure. Remember that if the mean arterial pressure drops below the intracranial pressure, blood flow to the head stops. You must avoid hypotension then at all costs because even a brief drop in the blood pressure can cause permanent brain damage. So when we're looking at the hemodynamics, what does hypovolemia cause in terms of the preload? Increase, decrease, or variable? It would be a decrease. How about the afterload? This is actually increased for the most part because the first response to hypovolemia is to increase vasoconstriction. Once the volume drops below the point where vasoconstriction can compensate, the afterload will drop, but that is when decompensated shock occurs. How about stroke volume? Decreased. And cardiac output? Decreased. Okay, let's move on. Cardiogenic shock. What's the pathophysiology? Well, it's really simple. The heart cannot produce enough output. The cardiac output drops. The problem is that because there are many reasons why the heart can't put out enough blood, you cannot determine what's going to happen to the afterload and preload. The vessels may be normal or constricted, only rarely are they dilated, and the volume may be normal high or low. This is the intravascular volume. So you can't judge just based on the fact that the patient has cardiogenic shock what the peripheral vasoconstriction or total blood volume will be. 
etiologies, myocardial infarction would be the obvious one. Arrhythmias, such as extreme tachycardias and bradycardias. Cardiomyopathies, where the muscle of the heart is too weak to pump. Congenital or valvular lesions, especially end-stage stenosis lesions. Blunt trauma, which bruises the heart and can actually decrease the ability of the muscles to move well and toxic sources such as beta blocker overdoses and calcium channel blocker overdoses. The major sign that you're going to find is that the left heart will stop pumping adequately. Once the cardiac output drops, the blood will back up from the left heart. And where does it end up if it backs up from the left heart? In the lungs. So the primary sign will be pulmonary edema. And the signs and symptoms you'll be seeing in addition to the other signs of shock, will be dyspnea, hypoxia, which can be severe, rawls or crackles, and frothy sputum, which is usually white. It isn't until their end stage that it turns pink. One important point, if at any time you get pulmonary edema plus hypotension, this is the most severe form of cardiogenic shock. It's classified as a stage 3 or 4. And in these patients, there can range between a 60 to 90 percent mortality because everything that you do to fix the pulmonary edema will make the hypotension worse. And everything you do to fix the hypotension will make the pulmonary edema worse. So for treatment, what would we do? Would you use CPAP? You betcha. CPAP has two factors that work. First of all, it increases the intraalveolar pressure, literally pushing the fluid back into the capillaries and out of the lungs. It also reduces the preload by increasing the intrathoracic pressure. Should you use fluids? Generally speaking, no. This is not a place where fluids are indicated. Could you use small amounts? Yes especially if you suspect that preload may stretch the muscles of the heart and allow increased contractility. The classic case where this may work is in a right ventricular MI. In those cases, small volumes of fluids may increase the cardiac output, at least temporarily. Are there any drugs you can use? Well, nitroglycerin is the classic. This would be a good thing because it drops the preload, the amount of fluid that's necessary to push, and it drops the afterload at higher doses, decreasing the pressure against which the heart is pushing. This can, combined, decrease the workload on the heart, increase the relative amount of oxygen available to the heart, and actually increase cardiac output. Unfortunately, it cannot be used if the patient is already hypotensive. One of the reflexes in the field for years is to give the patient furosemide. Probably not. This is no longer a first-line drug. And the reason is because if they have been on it for any length of time, if you look at their vessel parameters, which you cannot do directly in the field, they are intravascularly dry. Their kidneys have already taken out all the volume they can. The kidneys shut down at that point, and furosemide cannot work unless there's blood flow to the kidneys. If they have never been on furosemide, it is acceptable to attempt it. Usually a dose of 40 milligrams will do the job. Morphine is another standby that has been used for years, but we are probably not going to use it now. And the reason is that these patients are in desperate respiratory distress. And there is a risk of respiratory depression, which can outweigh the benefit of the sedation that accompanies morphine. What else could we possibly use? Well, let's try an inotropic agent. Now, remember that what we don't want to do is vasoconstrict the patient. So don't use something that would cause increase in vasoconstriction. An alpha-1 agent is not indicated. What do you need? you need a beta-1 agent. For this, you probably are going to use dopamine and you're going to stay in the low dose range. 5 to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute. You can even go down as low as 3. Watch out. Once you get down to 3, you may drop the blood pressure slightly. So let's look at the hemodynamics in cardiogenic. Preload. Increased. Decreased. Generally speaking, it's variable we don't know what the preload is. It may be normal or it may be high. How about afterload? 
generally speaking, markedly increased. Most of these people have incredibly high blood pressures. Stroke volume, decreased. I mean, that's after all what we're talking about, isn't it? And the cardiac output, decreased by definition. In distributive shock, the pathophysiology is fairly straightforward, but it causes profound problems. Instead of the actual volume within the blood vessels changing, the size of the blood vessel changes by causing massive vasodilation. In this case, it's not that we have less fluid, there is simply not enough fluid to fill up the bigger tank. Here the primary sign is warm shock. The skin is not cool and clammy as we would expect from hypovolemic shock. What are the causes of distributive shock? Well, this is where people tend to try to separate out different kinds of shock that are, are actually different causes because these are all distributive. The three types of distributive shock are neurogenic, septic, and anaphylactic. They all have vasodilation. They all share the warm or flushed skin. In neurogenic shock, there is transection or severe damage to the spinal cord, usually above T6 or so. The problem is that the sympathetic nervous system comes off the spinal cord in the thoracic area. So any transection at or above this level will tend to take out the normal sympathetic tone to the blood vessels in your body. This sympathetic tone causes vasoconstriction. Once you lose it, your body vasodilates. This loss of sympathetic innervation is immediate and can cause severe hypotension. Later, they become hyperreactive and can cause hypertension. In septic shock, there is an excessive immune reaction to infection. Again, this is almost like a severe anaphylactic reaction. It is usually caused by bacterial, rarely by fungal or viral infections. Anaphylactic shock is caused by an immune response that is excessive, and the specific problem that causes the vasodilation is the histamine release that it accompanies this immune response. In addition to the vasodilation, you can also develop hypovolemia in two types of distributive shock, anaphylaxis and septic. The reason is because both of these cause the capillaries to leak. There is fluid loss, third spacing, into the interstitial fluid, and it can also go into other spaces, such as the peritoneal and pleural space. Therefore, there is an absolute need for more fluids in addition to the volume simply needed to fill up the increased space. Treatment? Well, this is fairly straightforward. Give them more fluids. We've got to fill up this enlarged tank. Again, there is no consensus on the volume except, aha, a rule. This will help. In sepsis, yes, give the 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus. This is a standard of care now. It has been found that if we can get this volume on board rapidly, and it may take two or three boluses like this to do the job, we can save lives. This will be initiated under a septic shock protocol, which will be part of your protocols in the field. In this case, you do want to return the pressure to normal without overloading the patient. There are other treatments that you can use specifically for anaphylaxis. What is the drug that is the drug of choice for anaphylaxis? Epinephrine. Very straightforward. In adults, you're going to give 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams, 1 to 1,000 IM. If you need to go to an IV bolus, remember this should only happen if the patient is hypotensive. Go, use 0.1 milligram of 1 to 10,000 IV titrated. In pediatrics, you're going to use 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of 1 to 1,000 IM, 1 to 10,000 IV. Additional treatment in anaphylaxis, well, we want to stop the histamine response. So we're going to use an antihistamine. And the one you're going to use is diphenhydramine. There are other ones that are used, but this is the one that does the best job because it hits the histamine 1 receptors, which are the baddies in this particular response. This will stop the histamine reaction from getting any worse. It cannot fix the problem, however, and will take time for the body to overcome the histamine reaction that occurs.
Steroids are also used, usually methylprednisolone, but remember this is not the first line treatment as they will take several hours to have full effect. In the other forms of distributive shock, if the fluid doesn't work, you should consider a vasopressor. Now in this case, we do want to vasoconstrict. This is a vasodilation problem after all. So we do not want to use an inotropic agent. You need an alpha-1 agent. The drug that is the best is norepinephrine, but it's not usually available. But you do have dopamine and it will work. You just have to use high dose levels, usually 10 or more micrograms per kilogram per minute. Remember that you will markedly increase both the heart rate and the automaticity, i.e. the irritability of the heart, when you use this level of dopamine. Another choice is to use an epinephrine drip. In adults, this would be 2 to 10 micrograms per minute, and in a child, 0.1 to 1 micrograms per kilogram per minute. There is a caution with using norepinephrine specifically in neurogenic shock, and the reason, or any other vasopressor for that matter, and the reason is because even low dose vasopressors can cause dangerous hypertension. These receptors on the, ve on the vessels have been deprived of stimulation during a period of time they become excessively sensitive then to any exposure to a vasopressure and will overreact causing hypertension. So let's look at the hemodynamics for distributive shock. Preload. Well, it's going to go down because you don't all don't dilate just the arteries, you also dilate the veins. How about the afterload? Markedly decreased. This will go way down. Stroke volume variable. And the reason is because you're not only decreasing the preload, but you're decreasing the afterload. Generally speaking, the stroke volume will drop because of the decrease in the preload. And the cardiac output will drop, generally speaking. Sometimes, and this is a little counterintuitive, it may actually go up because of the drop in the afterload. It takes the load off the heart, and the heart can actually increase its cardiac output temporarily. Let's talk about obstructive shock now. What's the pathophysiology? Here the problem is that the venous return to the heart is obstructed. You can't get blood into the heart, you're not going to get blood out of the heart. And because it is the right side of the heart that is affected, the primary sign is going to be jugular venous distension. Now a couple of caveats about using jugular venous distension. First of all, it should be measured when the patient is sitting at 45 degrees. This is the standard by which we measure jugular venous distension. If it reaches more than 2 to 3 centimeters above the clavicle at 45 degrees, you have JVD. If the patient is hypovolemic, you may not see JVD. There, if you have a combined problem, such as a trauma patient with blood loss and a tension pneumothorax, you may not get the JVD. And it may also be present even without right heart failure with increased intrathoracic pressure, for instance, in severe COPD. So check your patient carefully. So what are the etiologies of obstructive shock? Pulmonary thromboembolism, pericardial tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and excessive positive pressure ventilation. So let's start with a pulmonary embolism. What do we mean by an embolism? Well, basically an embolism is any cl large clot that embolizes or moves from where it formed. For pulmonary embolisms, the source is generally speaking either the inferior vena cava or the leg veins. And we're not talking about the calf as much as we are talking about the thighs. They have to be fairly large clots to cause significant problems. When this clot moves, it's going to move through the inferior vena cava and enter the right heart. From there, it will be pumped out and lodge in the pulmonary artery. The question is, how much of the pulmonary artery will be blocked? If it is large enough to block both branches of the pulmonary artery, no blood can get to the lungs. Smaller clots will decrease the amount of blood that can get to the lungs depending on how big they are and how much of the pulmonary artery system they block. Here the primary sign you're looking for is hypoxia unrelieved by oxygen therapy.
Remember that this can occur from other reasons, but this is the most classic finding with pulmonary embolism. They will have normal breath sounds early. There is nothing wrong with a patient's ventilation, so don't count on hearing abnormal breath sounds. Later, as the damaged lung fills with fluid, you may hear crackles, but this will not be an early finding. Chest pain, by the way, may occur, but if there is chest pain, it will not be the pleuritic pain that develops later. Early on, the chest pain sounds like classic angina from the stress on the right heart. An EKG finding that can be associated with pulmonary embolism is S1, Q3, T3, a deep S in 1, a Q in lead 3, and an inverted T wave in lead 3. Unfortunately, this is neither specific nor sensitive. It causes false positives and false negatives. So you can't count on it. You have to look at the rest of your patient to decide what is happening. What treatment do you have? Well, unfortunately, there's only one. Move. You have to get the patient to the hospital. There is nothing else you can do in the field. You can try a fluid bolus. Sometimes there is absolutely nothing we can do in the hospital. If you look here, this is a post-mortem picture, and this is the pulmonary artery. Here's the pulmonary valve right there, and this is a clot completely filling up both the right and the left pulmonary arteries. Obviously, this patient died immediately. Another cause of obstructive shock, pericardial tamponade. Here there is a fluid accumulation in the pericardial sac, which is around the heart, and compresses the heart, specifically the atria. This does not allow the heart to fill and decreases the blood return to the heart. The primary sign here is going to be muffled or no heart tones. Reminding you that if the patient is in cardiac arrest and is in ventricular fibrillation or in a systole, you won't hear heart tones either. They should have, if they are still awake and talking to you, potential cause for pericardial effusion. The common causes for pericardial effusion include trauma, the most likely finding, cancer, fluid overload, especially from renal failure, and occasionally severe bacterial or other infections. If you suspect tamponade, the problem is pressure on the outside of the heart, and the way to fix it is to put fluid on the inside of the heart. So give a fluid bolus. Usually 250 to 500 mLs will do the job. You should get a temporary return in blood flow and an easing of the patient's symptoms. It will be temporary, however, but it may buy you 5 to 10 minutes and it can be repeated. Yet the next step is obviously emergent transport because no, you can't do a pericardiocentesis. Sorry. The last cause we're going to talk about is a tension pneumothorax. In this case, the air accumulates in the pleural space, around the lungs, not within the lungs. This shifts the mediastinum. As it shifts the mediastinum, it kinks the vena cava, especially the inferior vena cava, over the diaphragm, cutting off the blood flow from the lower half of the body. In addition, it push, pre puts pressure on the heart, especially on the right atrium and ventricle. In this case, again, we can't get blood back into the right heart. Here, the primary signs are fairly obvious breath sounds will be absent. Remember that they may be bilateral. It will be worse with positive pressure ventilation because positive pressure ventilation pushes air into a tension pneumothorax and does not allow its release. Treatment? Well, for you, try the normal saline or ringer lactate if that's in your protocol, but you have needle decompression. Do it. Get the air out. Let's look at the hemodynamics for obstructive shock. Preload, markedly decreased. This is the problem. No blood in, no blood out. Afterload is probably going to be variable. Most of the time it's increased because of the body's response to the low cardiac output. Stroke volume, markedly decreased. Cardiac output, decreased. In summary, let's review the perfusion classes and their classic findings. Hypovolemia, narrow pulse pressure. Cardiogenic, pulmonary edema. Distributive, warm, flushed skin. Obstructive, jugular venous distension. What specific findings might you see that would be consistent with, let's say, hypovolemic shock? Well, obviously, there would be a source of blood or fluid loss. You'll see the cool, clammy skin. 
How about cardiogenic shock? In addition to the pulmonary edema, they will almost undoubtedly have chest pain. They may have ECG changes, but they may be old. They may have the frothy sputum, but remember it will not be pink until they're almost end stage. This occurs when the capillaries literally rupture from the increased pressure within them. In septic shock, there should be a source or a risk of infection. And remember that the people who are at highest risk for infection will be your elderly, your diabetics, your infants, and anybody who has has immune suppression, specifically those patients with HIV, AIDS, or people who are on chemotherapy or have other immune response suppression from the drugs that they are taking. You can also look from, for edema from vascular leak, but this is a late finding. Neurogenic shock, the classic finding is going to be the demarcation between the level above the a cord disruption and below. Above the level of cord disruption, where the sympathetic system is still working, they will be cool and clammy. Below that level, they will be warm and dry. In anaphylactic shock, there should be signs of additional body systems being involved. For instance, bronchoconstriction with wheezing, upper airway cell swelling with strider, vomiting or diarrhea, always a very bad sign because this means it's gone systemic, and severe edema which may present as diffuse hives or simply total body swelling. Specific findings for obstructive shock besides the JVD, you should have some sort of history compatible with an obstructive process. If there is no JVD and you do have a history compatible with an obstructive process and other signs or symptoms that make you think that this is what's going on, First of all, you should be giving a fluid bolus. In trauma, you must consider the fact that the patient may be hypovolemic. Generally speaking, what are you going to do for shock? Fluids. Except, 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 cardiogenic. Use judiciously. Please don't reflexly give fluids to a patient with cardiogenic shock. Remember, they will be tachycardic from the shock itself. Giving fluids may not help them. If they're bleeding, stop it. That was easy. If you can stop it, give fluids. If you can't stop it, use permissive hypotension. In other cases, once you fill up the tank and you still can't get the blood pressure up to normal, consider using a vasoconstrictor, especially in which kind of shock? Distributive. Remember that you have already used a vasoconstrictor when you have given epinephrine in anaphylaxis, and you should not normally need a secondary uh, vasoconstrictor. It is not a first choice, however, to use vasoconstrictors in cardiogenic shock. Here you want an inotropic agent. Basically, you want to use a beta-1 agonist. In obstructive cardiogenic shock, just try to fix whatever the problem is if you can. Questions? You can email me or call me.